coming up. Now, when it comes to elected officials, uh, generally, I think it's in everybody's best interest to know whether they're elected officials, the people that they're putting an X beside when it comes to elections, have been willingly or semi-willingly participating in foreign interference. You'd agree with that? What should government be doing today to prevent hostile foreign state actors uh, like the dictatorship, the communist dictatorship in Beijing, from putting their, their thumb on the scale of Canadian democracy? In directing disinformation and interfering in the 2021 election as well as the 2019 election and notwithstanding that evidence it must be noted that this liberal government has done absolutely nothing to hold those consular officials accountable who interfered in our elections and attacked our democracy. Mr. Fung, you had mentioned uh, about fact-checking centers uh, in your opening remarks. Can you perhaps uh, expand on that concept? What did you mean by that? Like and subscribe. The committee is resuming its study of the impact of disinformation and of misinformation on the work of parliamentarians. Now, Mr. Bateman, you had uh, intimated at the outset of your remarks that you may not be um, as overly familiar with the uh, situation here, uh, but I want to just elaborate on a few of your principles that you spoke about. Now, you spoke about supply and demand when it comes to foreign interference or disinformation, um, and also the fact that it is politicians who are most often the sources of misinformation, disinformation. Uh, would you agree as well that politicians actually not only um, are critical when it comes to what they put out, but also in their function when um, they are in a, a security capacity and a capacity of uh, ensuring that disinformation doesn't get out. In other words, politicians, government plays a protective role. Would you agree with that? Uh, yes, I would. And part of that protective role is that when government sees things going awry, things going sideways, and they see misinformation and disinformation occurring, that government actually has an obligation to act. I, I take it you'd agree with that as well? Well, it depends on the nature of the action being contemplated, because some actions can be helpful and others can be counterproductive. Okay. So w what I'm saying is that <clears throat> when misinformation and disinformation are occurring, uh, the government can conceivably do nothing but to do nothing is to allow this to occur even more. Is that, isn't that right? Uh, to some extent, but typically a lot of information is transmitted through society without the government taking any particular action. Um, in the case of foreign influence activities, there's a lot more the government can do. But whether or not to uh, publicly disclose such activity or take technical measures or diplomatic measures against the country at issue is often a complicated calculation. Well, it, it certainly is a complicated calculation, but I think you'd agree that shining the light on foreign interference in some way is always the best antidote to address foreign interference, is it not? It often is. The exception to that principle is that Sometimes the foreign actor may anticipate and even desire or benefit from the public disclosure of their operation. Um, for example, if uh, Russia is conducting a, an influence operation that is publicly exposed, and then that public exposure actually creates a lot more societal anxiety and fear and distrust than the initial influence operation itself, that could be considered a win for Russia. So that's one of the complications saying. that government I, needs to consider. I see what you're saying. They're sowing chaos and they're getting their desired results. Now, when it comes to elected officials, uh, generally, I think it's in everybody's best interest to know whether they're elected officials, the people that they're putting an X beside when it comes to elections, have been willingly or semi-willingly participating in foreign interference. You'd agree with that? Yes. So uh, in such cases, transparency is paramount. Um, if the government is aware that elected officials are, are um, participating in foreign interference willingly, the best thing that can be done uh, is to address those things publicly, is it not? 
That would require a framework of law and, again, careful consideration. Uh, for example, I'm a former U.S. intelligence analyst, and so I'm familiar with the possibility that there could be unverified intelligence information about as someone being co-opted or roped into I, foreign yes, disinformation, but that I'm, might not be a legal certainty. Right. So, sorry, and I don't mean to cut you off, but uh, but I'm just going to ask you to operate on the assumption that uh, we have intelligence services in Canada that have verified and they have come to conclusions. And the conclusions are that 11 parliamentarians have, or either wittingly or semi-wittingly, um, uh, acting um, with... Uh, foreign and hostile states. This intelligence has been verified. It went into a report. In that case there, people in Canada are being expected to vote in the next 12 to 13 months, in all likelihood, on these people. Does it not make sense for democracy, for the integrity of the system, and for foreign interference to be stymied at its root to expose this and shine the light on it. Does that not make a ton of sense? Without commenting on the Canadian situation, because I don't know the details, I would just say there are situations where an intelligence assessment might fall short of a prosecutable offense, and that would then create a judgment call and a difficult uh, decision. Uh, but I, I'm not familiar with the Canadian specifics. Well, could there be any worse discord? You know, you talked about the Russia example. Is there anything worse... Um, any worse discord than people questioning whether who they're voting for is compromised by a hostile state? I do think one of the reasons that public disclosure can be helpful is when the lack of disclosure creates an environment in which selective leaks and rumors are running rampant. Uh, we saw this in previous U.S. elections, and that did seem to lead to a policy of greater disclosure, but not universal disclosure. Each disclosure needs to be taken on its own terms. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Bateman, Mr. Caputo. Uh, Mr. Baines, over to you. And the, do you think there ought to be like, greater scrutiny on candidates maybe running for uh, office, particularly if they have in the past worked closely with what we know are hostile states. The general trend in a number of democracies has been toward increasing transparency and tighter regulation of foreign influence, um, such as bolstering enforcement of uh, foreign registration requirements and the like. Um, traditionally, it's the voters themselves that are asked to be the ultimate gatekeepers. Yes, truly. And, and, but, but again, and that leads to our um, the general uh, complexities around the recommendations that I know that you, you've you've mentioned, and Mr. Fung's even mentioned some other um, issues around fact checking, and, and which makes it very difficult for the general public to really know because it's so um, uh, the misinformation and disinformation has become uh, so um, uh, very what do you call it? Um, uh, organized and and uh, very sophisticated in a sense. You know, there's a, other examples. Um, um, like for example, or maybe if you look at maybe some people that are working with, say, a foreign um, entity that's like a research group or um, producing reports. Um, we have an example here for uh, in in 2020 a member who's now currently a member of parliament, helped produce a controversial uh, report in association with the McDonald laurier Institute, and a reporter, a CBC reporter, alleged, alleging that Pakistan secretly created a Sikh separatist movement, and this was later amplified by officials overseas, Indian officials, and that led to more information and disinformation uh, spreading. Uh, so if you can maybe comment on that. Um, uh, sure. Yeah, I'm not aware of the specifics. I would say that, as I mentioned during my opening remarks, the boundaries of acceptable foreign involvement in domestic discourse are often unclear. Uh, for example, traditionally in democracies, it is acceptable for uh, a foreigner to speak um, in a domestic context, a foreign corporation, a foreign resident, um, a foreign business. Um, it could be called public diplomacy um, and the like. 
Um, and then equivalently, it could traditionally be acceptable for you know a, a citizen or a politician domestically to engage with foreigners. Uh, where things often become more challenging is when there is some kind of covertness to the relationship and a violation of domestic law. Um, but I'll say just the norms and the boundaries around this uh, are really being re- thought and reinvestigated for this new era. Mr. Fong, um, we've spent some time focusing on state actors. We've highlighted adversarial countries who we believe are uh, acting in malicious ways kind of against our democracy and to undermine our institutions. However, a recent example of uh, what what ended up being, I guess, a, a plot by a pretty amateur person to boost the appearance of the conservative leader in a, in a northern event uh, led to much discussions and cynicism around the future of our own kind of democratic processes here domestically. Can you perhaps for a minute just talk about the ways in which non-state actors, both sophisticated uh, and or corporate, as well as just unsophisticated people with access to technology who could potentially disrupt? The non-state actors, like Correct. companies, right? Not just companies, but ideologically motivated people, mm -hmm. uh, whether they're attached formally to think tanks or whether they're lone actors, hackers, people kind of in a, you know, I, I envision them in a dark basement, just like really trying to manufacture consent around something they care about. Like just how widespread is this technology? How usable is it in its current forms? And maybe just talk about ways that, um, that it's accessible. Yeah, so um, in the current way, some of the non-state actors, they, they, um, they, they are working to, together to boost some disinformation together. So, um, for example, they will uh, like some posts uh, to, uh, together. This is one of the ways that we can use to detect this type of uh, activities. Let's say um, there are... Uh, thousands of, of posts that talk about television, uh, for, for example, right? So um, if both of us would like to talk about televisions, it is very unlikely that we will, we will co-like or co-comment on the same uh, set of posts. So we can use this type of information to detect this type of uh, technology. Mr. Bateman, just to, again, like I think about, you know, Elon Musk and his takeover of Twitter and the way in which he's shaping the discourse of this digital kind of public forum. Can you talk about non-state actors and the threat potentially to undermine our democracy? Yes, I would say actors other than foreign states are the main sources of mis- and disinformation. Uh, if you think about the perspective of an individual voter going through an election cycle, What's all the political information that he or she encounters? Almost none of it would be from any foreign actor. It would be from friends, families, community leaders, national politicians, local politicians, and the news media. That is really the information environment in some and substance. And so if any of those actors are spreading mis- and disinformation, as is frequent, that would be the primary problem facing democracies. And, and Mr. Bateman, in your work, you, you've identified 10 policy interventions, but you've also stated there's no silver bullet. With some specificity, given the contemplation that we have with this committee for recommendations, what might you suggest as a series of, of policy interventions that might be helpful, um, notwithstanding the 10 that you've already provided? Or maybe you want to highlight a couple of them. From the ten, uh, I would highlight. I would highlight at least two on there and one that's not on there. Uh, the two that I would highlight are supporting local journalism and um, supporting media literacy programs. Uh, and I mention those not because they're better or worse than the others, but because they have a higher ceiling. They could accomplish more over time than many of the other more small bore measures that we're already highly invested in, um, but are more tactical in nature. Uh, the third recommendation that I would make is kind of a meta recommendation, and it's that we need to get better about informing ourselves about these informational dynamics and threats. And so that would start with, for example, helping researchers get better access to information from tech platforms and creating grants and other pathways to ensure this research actually occurs. And would that include kind of algor algorithmic uh, transparency? 
It could include algorithmic transparency. Um, it could also include transparency about um, major accounts and interactions and platforms. There's a whole host of data, um, and a colleague of mine at Carnegie has uh, compiled some of that. I'd um, be happy to pass that on. Okay. Uh, I, I, on that theme, it was noted that there have been changes... Um, that it's not being studied, sorry, by independent researchers. I'm talking again about uh, algorithms mm -hmm. in meaningful ways and that market viability for such changes is uncertain since the core business platform, uh, business model for all major platforms is based on optimizing engagement. In fact, is it not the case that our major platforms have an incentive for what they call clickbait or rage clicking, uh, which is often fed by misinformation and disinformation? Unfortunately, yes. Every platform is based on a business model of maximizing people's time and interest on the platform. And so that means the content that does well algorithmically is content that intrigues, outrages, upsets, amuses. Uh, and then false content is often more inclined to be sensational, outrageous, and clickbaity. Um, so we do have a conflict of interest here with the platforms. They are designed in many ways to um, spread this information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I Mr. still have 15 seconds. Is that right? Well, you, you got eight now. Okay. Never mind. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Bateman, uh, Mr. Fung, Mr. Green. Uh, that concludes our first round of questioning. Mr. Barrett, you have five minutes. Go ahead, sir. Mr. Fung, given what we know about the disinformation campaigns targeting our elections, and particularly by the campaign uh, perpetrated by the communist dictatorship in Beijing against former conservative member of parliament Kenny Chu, the, the current liberal government has failed to adequately address this. And this is, you know, borne out by the, the fact that we have to have a, a commission um, to look into foreign interference and um, that the legislation that's been put forward has uh, has not come in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh years of their of their mandate. Um, what should government be doing today to prevent hostile foreign state actors uh, like the dictatorship, the communist dictatorship in Beijing, from putting their their thumb on the scale of Canadian democracy? So. Um my first recommendation is to set up, uh, there are two, di two different ways. One way is to set up a government uh, agencies like the U.S. model, like the Global Engagement Center, that will uh, give them the authority to uh, monitor the social media posts that are related to the democratic process. So they have the, te the te technological capability and the uh, legal uh, authority to stop some of this, this uh, disinformation. Another approach is to is to create a not-for-profit organization and then uh, give that organization the authority to do a similar process but more independent from the, from the government. Yeah. Um, can you provide some examples for, for um, anyone who's not familiar and for the uh, purpose of our report of the uh, type of uh, actions that the CCP, the, the communist dictatorship in Beijing, has used to uh, try and influence uh, our elections, and, um, and if you have another example of any a countermeasure that could be applied to that uh, example that you provide. Okay. So one of the uh, examples, for example, is the, um, they are not just focusing on, on the social media disinformation. When you talk about disinformation, we often talk about the social media. But for the CCP, they are not just working on social media. They also work with traditional media, which is the Chinese media running in Canada. And they are newspaper, they are radio stations in Vancouver and Toronto. And they are collaborating uh, with the CCP, different Chinese organizations running in Canada. So, and one of the questions raised uh, previously, what's the difference between Russians and the, this disinformation and the Chinese disinformation here is the economic power in here because they can use the advertisement to control, to indirectly control the radio station and newspaper on what they put on their contents. How do they invite different uh, commentators to the radio stations? So they can, they can use the local economic power to control that 
which is not the same in, in the Russian case. So to um, fight against this type of collaboration, I think the C70 will play, will play part of the role which is trying to, um, f to identify the foreign agent in, in, in this case. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Bateman, you know, you're someone who has experience assessing a, a foreign state senior leadership and, and cybersecurity. Are you able to identify any systems or countermeasures that, uh, that the current government could have put in place to this point or could now quickly put in place to protect us from um, malicious uh, state actors, you know, to protect our national security, our, our economy, to protect our democracy? I'm not specifically familiar with gaps within the Canadian system, but I can offer some best practices from other systems. Um, so there are a variety of tools that are available to governments to fight uh, foreign interference. Um, one of them is uh, naming and shaming, sanctions, indictments. Um, another is uh, targeted technical actions, such as cyber operations that could be carried out to uh, disrupt the foreign activity, especially during a temporary sensitive period, such as before or after an election. Um, and there are others as well, uh, like Professor Fung uh, mentioned, uh, simply uh, public disclosure and public information. Um, and so one path would be to build capacity in each of those areas. But another path would be to build connectivity across these areas and make sure that they're working together, which is something the U.S. government has done. Um, I will say that in the end, it's not clear how effective any of these policies are. Uh, we've been naming and shaming and indicting and sanctioning uh, and, uh, and disrupting these adversaries for some time, and it probably has some operational impact on them, uh, but it doesn't stop the activity. In your publication, you talk about the importance of perhaps, or maybe it's a recommendation, to find a way to change the way algorithms are used. I'm interested in your thoughts on um, how that's possible, make us understand what that would look like, how that might help solve the problem, and maybe why that hasn't been studied by independent researchers yet, um, or if it's just beginning, or if you expect that to happen in the near term. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so, as we've discussed, the major social media platforms today have recommendation algorithms and other design choices, such as the way their buttons and apps uh, look and feel and interact, um, that are designed to maximize engagement. But you could maximize something else. Uh, you could maximize, um, for example, um, the civility of discourse, uh, so that if there were a long series of posts going back and forth on a controversial issue, you could actually uh, bring to the top the one that seems the most uh, clear and helpful and is achieving some amount of support or balance from both sides. Um, other people have explored using algorithms to deter or dissuade people from posting toxic content. Um, by trying to nudge them in a more positive direction. There's many, many options here. In, in essence, we just have to maximize for something other than engagement or for a combination of engagement with something else. Now, why hasn't this been done? It's because engagement is how you attract eyeballs. Eyeballs is how you attract advertisers or subscribers and thereby make money. Uh, so there are academics who are experimenting with what are sometimes called civically oriented platforms. Um, and it's a worthwhile effort, but it's unlikely that these would ever be commercially viable alternatives because people actually want the high engagement platforms. So... Okay, so if they were to, um, I'm going to stretch this a little bit, but look for the positive, try to encourage positive. Is that, like we used to use this, this line, if it, if it bleeds, it leads for, for news stories. So um, <laughs> you heard that before, Mr. Green? Um, you know, it's easier to enrage. It's easier to get people to complain or to post something maybe or pay attention to something a little more toxic. What does that, and you touched on this because you said that might reduce the advertising um, funds that these social media platforms might get if they decided to change the algorithms to be in a more positive direction. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on what that might look like monetarily. Is that something that you've even looked at? Is it going to cut potentially their profits in half? Is it, 
Is it, is it that significant? I don't have an estimate, but I think it would be extremely significant. And I think the most important factor from a competitive point of view is, is this something that a platform would be endeavoring to do by itself, thus falling behind in the competitive marketplace? Or is this something that would happen collectively? And I'll give an example that has been playing out in real life. Um, I believe the European Union now has a regulation that requires platforms to at least offer an option for a chronological feed instead of an algorithmically curated feed. Um, now, it's not that big a deal to just offer that as an option. Most users do choose the default. But that form of regulation then creates a level playing field so that all platforms would have that as an option. So, so just spitballing here, um, Threads doesn't seem to be nearly as uh, toxic as X. Uh, is there an algorithm that's driving that less toxicity in Threads than, than in X? It's difficult to say. Um, because we know very little about the internal governance of these platforms, and that's an important research and governance problem in and of itself. Um, it is clear that at the high level of business strategy and corporate leadership, Mark Zuckerberg with Threads wants Threads to be relatively anodyne and devoid of political content and controversy, more of a feel-good place, whereas Elon Musk wants X to be a kind of wild and free-spirited environment in which people can get their kicks. So when elected officials, or in our case parliamentarians, are targeted by malicious actors, what strategy can we use to protect ourselves and remedy the harms that uh, to ourselves and Canada's political system? Well, it's difficult for me to give advice because I think a working elected politician is probably a, a smarter than I am about how to handle the, the push and pull of uh, aggressive politics, including even foreign actors. Uh, but there are a few options in the toolkit. Um, one is that if something is blatantly transgressing legal and normative boundaries, like involvement from a foreign actor, um, that can be disclosed. Um, and, uh, you know, you might even garner sympathy for that. Um, but I think often if there's a false narrative circulating, there's actually a difficult decision about whether to respond to it and thus give it credence um, and maybe even elevate the number of people that are thinking about and hearing about it or whether to just let it lie. Because, frankly, many influence campaigns and misinformation campaigns are not effective. I mean, this is the kind of elephant in the room. Uh, we don't know how effective many of these things are, but many of them are demonstrably ineffective. So that's an important strategic decision. Mr. Fong, any um, input there? Um, I think uh, tran transparency is the key, is a key. So I think uh, I would suggest to this to talk about the, the truth, and then um, that's it. Yeah. Are there any resources, perhaps, that we can rely on to ensure that we're not improperly influenced by misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation? Uh, there are some disinformation uh, debunking web websites in in Canada, but. Again, the, re the resources from the government is not enough to make it uh, more e more e uh, effective in the society. What, what type of scale do you think would be? And just uh, not a you know mm. precise estimate, but in terms of the scale of the problem, what type of investment might meet this, the scope of the uh, problem? For example, I, as I mentioned, in Taiwan, they have a very uh, effective civil society running uh, uh, fact-checking centers. They have two. And they are basically by donation, and then there's some think tank that are indirectly supported by the by the government. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Green, Mr. Fung. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Mr. Cooper now for five, and then followed by Ms. Khalid for five, and that'll be the end of the panel. Mr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Fung, one of the uh, tools that this government set up supposedly to counter foreign interference and foreign disinformation during elections was the directive on the critical election incident public protocol. Are you familiar with that protocol? Uh, I'm not familiar with that You're protocol. You're not familiar with it. Okay. Uh, needless to say, uh, it provided that uh, candidates uh, who are the target of disinformation ought to be infor informed, barring national security 
considerations. Now, uh, my former colleague, Kenny Chu, was drowning in a sea of disinformation in Steveston, Richmond East, and he wasn't alone in that regard. Several other conservative candidates uh, were, including former member of parliament, Alice Wong. Mr. Chu was kept in the dark. Uh, in the face of disinformation, but Madam Justice Ho concluded there was a reasonable possibility that those narratives from the Beijing regime impacted the result in that <laughs> writing. Now, you spoke uh, about um, the PRC and the connections between the PRC and certain media within Canada. And I would note in that regard that at page 17 of the ENSICOP report, uh, it, the, the ANSICOP noted that, quote, uh, most of these media outlets in the GVA, in the Greater Vancouver area, were linked to the PRC via partnership agreements with the Chinese News Service, the Chinese Communist Party's primary media entity. So here you not only have foreign disinformation from Beijing amplified on social media platforms, including WeChat, but you actually have news outlets uh, that are amplifying that disinformation that are Canadian-owned. So can you speak to that uh, and, and, and some of the methods that the Chinese regime is using and how that can be countered? Um, because it's, it certainly was something that uh, may have impacted the result uh, in more than one riding. So let's say for the Kenny Chu's case, right? So it was first started in WeChat and WhatsApp. A piece of this this disinformation appeared on the social media, and then it was spread on the China, mainly on the Chinese uh, social media platform. And then the next day, um, there's a, a Chinese propaganda newspaper, Today Commercial News, uh, try to basically copy paste that message from the WeChat and then amplify it on the on the propaganda machines, and then. After that, many other Chinese news articles were writ was written uh, in on different Chinese web websites, and then it feed back to the social media. And on, then on the radio stations and newspaper in Vancouver area, they also try to uh, uh, have a uh, or re re uh, basically invite some bias uh, commentators on the radio stations to amplify this again. So this is not just on the media because they are uh, indirectly controlled by the. <coughs> Ever, uh, advertisement from the Chinese merchant in that area. So, and then when they try to, let's say, when they, uh, when the uh, some of the uh, organization try to organize an event, they will invite the uh, Chinese consulate to attend those events, and then they will put those Chinese consulates at a higher position as a VVIP than the MP in Canada. So if you are an attendee of that meeting, you will know that who is the real boss in there and who is the one who can make decision is the Chinese consulate. So this message passed to the Chinese merchant in Richmond or in the Vancouver area, in the area and then it will affect the, show, the, the media in that, in that area. Well, thank you for that. And uh, it has been noted the role that Beijing-based consular officials played in directing disinformation and interfering in the 2021 election as well as the 2019 election and notwithstanding that evidence it must be noted that this liberal government has done absolutely nothing to hold those consular officials accountable who interfered in our elections and attacked our democracy uh, to the benefit of the liberal party now i do want to uh, ask you uh, mr fung you talked about the need for transparency and indeed, that is consistent with uh, what CSIS has recommend, recommended, that uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. Uh, but there are challenges with that, particularly in uh, diaspora quick, communities. Quick, quick. Uh, do you have any recommendations on how uh, disinformation of the kind that was going on in the 2021 election in uh, Chinese diaspora communities uh, can be effectively countered because it, it's okay. it, there are unique challenges in that regard in getting yeah. to people to Mr. make them Cooper, aware of that disinformation. We're, we're, we're way over time. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Fung to respond to that question in writing. I will have the clerk follow up with you, sir, uh, exactly what Mr. Cooper was asking for. And if you could follow that up in writing, I would appreciate that so we can move on. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, sorry, Mr. Cooper, we were, we were over time. Uh, Ms. Khalid, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses uh, who have uh, appeared today and shared your expert testimony. I find it quite uh, quite weird that uh, you know the conservatives uh, make it a, a big point to make this issue a partisan issue. The reality of the matter is that it is not a partisan issue. Uh, as uh, as outlined, uh, there have been challenges with how elections um, have been run and the the vulnerabilities that our de democratic institutions have had. Um, We've also seen reports recently that the Conservative Party is at risk of uh, foreign interference from, from Russia, from India, of money being put in into artificial intelligence, into bots, into social media campaigns, etc., to sway public opinion in favor of a political party. And I don't think that there's anybody to blame here specifically, but there is accountability that needs to be to put into place within all political parties and to remove the partisanship from this very, very serious issue. So, Mr. Fung, you had mentioned uh, about fact-checking centers uh, in your opening remarks. Can you perhaps uh, expand on that concept? What did you mean by that? And how would it help in ensuring uh, that our democratic institutions are, are well protected? So for those fact-checking centers, there are two groups of people. One is uh, information uh, professional and social scientists. Uh, they try to analyze the tactics and the technological uh, ad, uh, advancement used by those uh, people who spread the disinformation. And then by understanding that, we can prevent the next wave of disinformation. Another group of people are grassroots citizens. So they, they, they share the workload from the information professional because of the large info, uh, information that they receive. So, um, and also they have the social network to spread the information back to the society. So that is also very important. And by doing these settings, it also gained the trust from the general public because uh, they know they can participate in this process. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, sorry, I can't see your name there. Uh, Mr. Bateman, would you like to comment on that as well? Sure. Um, of all of the ways that have been proposed for countering disinformation, fact checking is probably the one that's been most studied. Um, there are many, many studies of fact checking initiatives. And the general finding is that uh, they do work to an extent. They particularly work on correcting factual uh, beliefs. Um, that corrective effect is not necessarily enduring over time, and it does not necessarily change the attitudes or the behaviors that uh, then result from that belief. Uh, so, for example, you might learn that a certain policy is based on a factual error, but you might still continue to support that policy. Um, there are hundreds of fact-checking initiatives worldwide um, that's to be commended and supported. Um, in many countries, uh, fact-checking itself has become the source of partisan controversy. And so uh, I think fact-checking is promising and should be continued. Uh, I also worry that its effectiveness could be degraded over time uh, as it's the victim of partisan mudslinging. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Bateman, because that is one of the major concerns where people have just, you know, like, and a lot of my constituents just stop listening to news, stop reading news, because they just can't distinguish what is true and what is not true anymore. And uh, it just, I think, hurts our democratic process when we see um, uh, parliamentarians actively uh, kind of uh, leveraging that, uh, that disdain towards, uh, towards news. I do have one more question. Uh, and I'll ask both of you, I'll start with Mr. Fung. What role do you think social media companies have to play um, in distinguishing between what is foreign interference, what is influence, and what is advocacy? Um, because there is a distinction, and I think that people have a difficult time, especially Canadians, uh, in, in trying to understand what that, what that distinction is between the three. So um, for the social media company, they definitely have the responsibility and capability to differentiate these different uh, activities because they own all the data. And even the government do not see that, in, uh, that piece of uh, information. By using AI and the more recent data mining technologies, um, they have a way to differentiate them. Yeah. 
Uh, Mr. Bateman, if you'd like to comment as well. I do agree that both government and platforms have a piece of the puzzle. Uh, platforms have extraordinary insight into on-platform activity, um, including non-public activity. Uh, governments have, can have extraordinary insight into some non platform activity, um, such as if they can intercept communications or embed human agents in these foreign intelligence services. For better or worse, platforms have been allowed to and left to develop their own rule set around what is considered acceptable and unacceptable on their platforms. And so each platform has taken a slightly different approach. They have a different language. Some of them are almost quasi-judicial processes. Others are much more freewheeling. Um, I don't know that there's an effort to standardize all of this, but I Thank do you. think good communication between government and platforms is essential. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Uh, we did go over time there. I want to thank uh, both our guests for being here today.